Uh, so hi, it's Kim from Permaculture Australia here. We're here for our monthly video interview series with three very special guests. And we're talking today about what is effective permaculture aid in international development. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce our three guests. We've got John Champagne from Brogo Permaculture Gardens here, who's had a lot of experience working internationally in countries such as India and Indonesia, and is also the convener of PA's Perma Fund. Hi, John. G'day. How are you, Kim? We've got Morag Gamble here from the Permaculture Education Institute, who's also had a large amount of experience working internationally, um, and in particular recently in East Africa with the Perma Youth Group and also with her Permaculture Education Institute, among a whole raft of other activities as well. Hi, Morag. Hi, Kim. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. And then finally, we have Lachlan McKenzie, or Lockie, um, based in South Australia, who has spent a lot of time working in, um, I guess, tropical countries or areas, a lot of time in Timor-Leste, as well as Indonesia. And he also co-wrote the Tropical Permaculture Guidebook and has also been heavily involved in setting up Permatil Global as well. Hi, Lockie. Hello. It's good to be here. Thanks. Just before we launch into the questions, um, I just wanted to acknowledge the traditional owners as well of the land of which I'm meeting anyway. I'm in Lutrawita, Tasmania, in northern Tasmania, and acknowledging the traditional owners past, present and emerging. So thanks everyone for joining. I'm going to turn my video off because my internet connection won't be so great here in Tassie on the small island, um, but we'll still see the other three guests on the screen. But I guess, first of all, just to kick off, I'd really love to hear about some of the permaculture aid projects that you've been involved with, either national or international. And perhaps we can start with you, Lockie, then on to Morag and John. Great, thanks, Kim. Um, yeah, I got, first got involved uh, back in well, early 2000. I, I first went to Timor in 2001 looking to um, hopefully be an effective volunteer and I knew some permaculture projects going on in Timor um, and I got stuck there for five years or more, which was great. Um, I had a, an amazing time learning a lot more than I taught probably, but we um, <clears throat> helped, well, basically there was a Timorese NGO that developed over that time called Permatil, Permaculture Timor-Leste. And they're still going strong today and influencing and working with and teaching everyone from schools to government to international NGOs and working directly with communities all over Timor on all sorts of different projects. Um, so I was very happy to be a part of that work for a good five years or so, which was um, exciting to actually be living and seeing the effects of, of work on the ground over a long period of time. Through that work, I got to know some great people in Indonesia and spent a couple of years working in Indonesia and got to get to I went to Aceh after the tsunami and um, and still have a lot of contact and have Hopefully Lockie will come back. Lockie. While we're waiting for Lockie to jump back, can we jump to you, Morag, um, if you'd like to start talking while we see if we can get Lockie back on the call? Sure. Well, Lockie might jump in any time. But I'll, I'll jump off from where he was talking about. The, um, I was also involved in some of the projects that um, Lockie was uh, part of. I first started doing this kind of work back in 1999, uh, working in, in Indonesia with EDEP. Uh, we were we ran a, a women's course for women all over Indonesia, um, based based in Bali, and and we um, and so that was kind of the beginning of my work in this in this kind of way, uh, and since then worked in a lot of different sort of community village type projects. Um, my main work now, though, um, at this present moment, is focusing on working with young people in 
uh, in, uh, largely in refugee settlements. And so uh, both in Kenya and Uganda and linking them globally with young people. So through the PEMA youth movement and what we do through the Permaculture Education Institute is offer mentors uh, free places to be part of this global community of learners to learn how to become educators at the same time as support them to offer free permaculture education to youth in all of these different centers. And actually it was interesting the other day, one of the, one of the leaders of the, this program was called into the government office and he thought, oh no, they're going to ask me to sort of start paying taxes for this community farm I'm setting up on the, on the land. And, and he said, he went into the office and, um, and the government official there said, so why is it that these programs are only available for, for refugees? What about the host community? And they would benefit so much from all of this kind of thing that you're doing. I, we see what you're doing and it looks really good. And so he said, okay, sure. So our next program is actually going to be a combination of, of um, so we'll support him to set it up so that they'll, they'll have the refugees from many countries as well as the host communities too. So, so it's a lot about offering contextual permaculture education that they're designing, meeting their basic needs, and particularly at the moment with, um, with COVID um, affecting the food distribution networks and, and a key thing being um, just basic food security and getting food gardens happening, but also keeping young people occupied because at the same time, um, with all the schools closed, there's been lots of um, violence and um, teenage pregnancies, and so actually helping with with programs that are that are engaging kids and, and offering learning and business opportunities for them so that's kind of where i'm focused now and there's lots of different facets to that but that's kind of just a little introduction and i'll toss the ball back to Lockie because he's back thank you hopefully um internet stays stable i'm not sure which part you got up to um I would just like to say though, after I've kept in contact and kept working with the group in Timor um, and through other work have been quite connected with using that experience and, and those networks and, um, and the resources that have been developed to work with groups in a lot of other countries as well. And then to, um, to be part of that um, sharing of the, the knowledge of hopefully what how, how good permaculture aid work um, is implemented. Um, so that's enough for me for now. Shall I hand over to John? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Lockie. Thanks, Lockie. Yeah, it's interesting on, on a personal level, uh, interesting that there's a connection there with IDEP, the other two speakers. And my first engagement overseas was with IDEP in, in teaching PDCs, both in Indonesia and then later on in India. And the focus was very much about delivering PDCs and then following up with teacher training and trying to find locals that will take that step up to deliver permaculture education in their language to their marginal farmers or their community. So that's what Sharon and I have been doing for the last uh, t 10 years, which, is, which has been great. But uh, here in Australia, I've been the convener of uh, Permafund for the last eight years and Basically, Permafund is a nickname we give to a group of people, volunteers that uh, look after Permaculture Australia's tax deductibility status. So basically, what we do is we search around for NGOs that are already existing in countries throughout the world and offer a small grants round of anywhere between $1,000, $2,000 to assist them in, um, in, in projects they're doing. So that's, that's been the main focus at Permafund for the last eight years and um, continues uh, to do so. Great, thanks, John. And just to add, there's been 51 projects as well funded through Permafund over the last, I think, eight or so years, which is fantastic across 15 countries. So it's been a really worthwhile project that, that yourself and the team have been involved with, which is great. Yeah. Um, all three of you sort of alluded to this, but I'd be really interested to, to have a few more details and particularly for those listening along at home as well. But what do you think makes a good permaculture aid project? What are some of the characteristics or can you share some examples of great projects and why you think they were so successful? 
So anyone can jump in first. Hmm. Well, I'll jump in. Um, one of the one of the key things that I really focus on in in offering support. So we we have the Ethos Foundation, which is a registered uh, charity, um, not tax deductible status though. So basically, you know, people approach us at any time throughout the year uh, with projects and often they have some sort of relationship with us already through the Education Institute or through PERMA Youth. And so it's a, it's a different relationship that we, that we have. And so they approach us and they say, look, you know, um, this is what, this, what's happening in our community. This is what we need. And so then we, we start to um, explore that more and find funding to support that project. And we, we work with them to create budgets and we, we provide enough money to cover what that is. And they constantly give feedback so the community can then see what it is that they've been, um, been supporting. Uh, so one example I can share with you would be, say, the women's farm in, in Kenya, and which is not actually in a, in a refugee settlement, but this is a woman that um, uh, I actually spent time with when I was in Kenya last time. And she, she lives in this uh, quiet, very poor area and doesn't have much access to resources. Her, her husband's died. She's a grandmother. She works with lots of other grandmothers. And this they have this women's group and this women's group decided that probably one of the best things they could do would be to create a community farm, a farm where that they could um, have enough land together to grow food that they could then feed their families, um, do extra value adding produce. They could have, an, have enough significant space that they could then start to educate other people. They were situated near a school so they could get school groups in it. it there's all these ripple effects. So it was, the education, the food, the demonstration, the um, micro enterprise, all these things wrapped together. And, and so what we did was we helped them buy that land over a period of six months. And so just the other day, actually, um, I sent the last, um, last bit of money. And so they're about to have a big celebration. And, and now this, that, so that's their community education. So it's a new commons in their village, which is a mm, space. Fantastic. Yeah. That's such a positive story, Malreg, and so community-led as well, which I guess is one of the, the traits or characteristics that makes a really good and effective permaculture project. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, Lockie or John, have you got some examples to share as well? Yeah, I'll, <clears throat> I'll come in here. So some of the, um, it's quite varied, I guess, the, um, the types of projects that, that we funded. Um, obviously, it has to sort of attain to uh, permaculture uh, ethics as a, as a starting point, but um, some of the examples would be um, seed saving, seed sovereignty, um, example groups in Tamil Nadu in India, uh, growing out um, old variety maize varieties that they can then, um, after the first season, share out to other villages and keeping that genetic um, seed uh, possible. A big one is um, marginal farmers, moving them away from the chemical regime of the Green Revolution back to organic and sustainable farming practices. That's a really big one, uh, particularly we found in, found in India. So it, it, look, it might be worm farming or making bio, biochar projects, stuff like that. Um, in Africa, you're getting into um, you know, rocket stove demonstration sites um, areas like that. Uh, a big one also is is, is women empowerment and, and children, and and particularly in school gardens, uh, that's a really strong focus too. And then of course there's the land management areas like water management, and and wastewater management projects as well. So it's a, it's a fairly large gamut in terms of um, you know what 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 does make a good permaculture project. Amazing. Thanks, John. Uh, Lockie, anything to add from your experiences? Yeah, I think just looking at the basic understanding of, um, as Morag said, working with communities to actually work with them to, to record their assets, to, to understand what their challenges are, to, to work out their goals, and then to develop the projects based on um, those outcomes from working through those plans with the community and then um, 
developing the skills and the knowledge within the community as the project builds. And I think um, just watching on how it worked in Timor, and that was the, the basic ethos of Permatil's work um, in terms of building up the knowledge base and, and working to, to show that the demonstrations of, of each, like of the seed saving or the um, making clay ovens or um, making compost and compost teas, uh, whatever the, the project was to actually work through those processes uh, so that communities who are quite vulnerable, obviously, are, are confident to actually implement these, these projects. But they're all based on what the community have deemed important for their progress towards um, you know, secure livelihoods, sustainability, their own environment, awareness of environmental restoration of their areas. Um, and that's now moving strongly into water restoration and protection uh, projects around very strong permaculture water catchment principles of um, collecting, storing and spreading the water so that the wet season water is caught. And springs are being slowly revived. People are working around replanting and protecting those spring areas from, from animal grazing and, and they understand why. And they're actually initiating their own responses through that and terms that are actually working with the youth to really lead that focus towards um so it's environmental awareness but also um obviously water security for the villages as well as for their agriculture it's amazing and it's really great to see both yourself and morag and some of the perma fund projects as well have got a focus on youth as well who are quite often from my experience anyway in projects i've worked on forgotten we we don't re we don't remember that youth have such incredible skills and contributions to make to projects in in countries where we're where we're working and promoting permaculture and it's so fantastic to see that youth are leading the charge in a number of your projects as well both in timor leste as well as with all of the perma youth activities including with morag's daughter who's doing some fantastic work leading co-leading perma youth as well um did anyone can i ask yeah, something there too because um you know i think the, the, the youth thing is really important because a lot of the countries where we're working, the, you know, the, the average age is really, really quite young. And so one of the things that, you know, in terms of asking them what it is that they want to see in their communities, what are the things that are concerning them? You know, sometimes some surprising things pop up. And I, one of the projects that we've started to support, and we're just looking for some funding for this right now, um, there's a group of young uh musicians in in kukuma refugee camp who are uh, they're rappers <laughs> so they're doing permaculture raps and they've they've recorded a few songs already and made uh, music videos with them their goal is to to ripple out what permaculture can offer their community as far and wide as possible using music that people relate to and want to listen to uh, that are in their generation and and it's just brilliant, you know, when people hear their music, they absolutely, absolutely love it. And they won an award through Realliance. Uh, and then uh, in talking with uh, Permaculture Magazine, you know, we're, we're looking for ways to try and find, you know, direct sponsor to help get them the equipment so they can set up their own music studio. And um, so they can make their own films, their own music without having to sort of go and organise it somewhere else. So, you know, they come up in surprising ways. You know, I started out with, you know, the gardens and the women's groups and, and, and now there's this, we're setting up a permaculture music studio. I never expected that would be the work we're doing, but that's <laughs> what came up. <laughs> that's fantastic. And I've seen some of those videos as well. They're incredible. So we'll make sure we'll put the links to, oh, to those um, on your YouTube at the end of this. Um, session as well so people can check them out but just before we move on can you just clarify for those who may not be aware where Kakuma is as well? Kakuma is uh, a refugee settlement in the in the north in the sort of desert region of, of the north of northwest of Kenya. Yep great thank you just in case people aren't aware 
and Lockie, you would also see this in Timor-Leste as well. There's an incredibly high um, population of youth there as well and Perma Youth or with Permatil have been doing some great activities there as well. Yeah, they, they certainly have. And I think when I was living there, the average age, more than 50% of the population mm. was under 17. Um, the average age is still very, very low uh, compared to a lot of other um, minority world countries. Um, but yeah, Permatil obviously had a big focus as well on the permaculture school gardens. They're getting prim permaculture into the national primary school curriculum, uh, which has had a huge impact. I think over 200 school gardens. Um, and again, the ripple out effects of getting that happening has a positive impact on the communities around as well as turning the students into teachers as they learn in the schools. Uh, um, and the gardens are, are utilised for other lessons as well. Um, Timor is naturally quite an outdoor society, so kind of getting having the kids locked up in classrooms isn't good for their education or their concentration. So having them outside and learning, you know, doing science lessons in the garden and other things is really, really important. Um, they've also been, I think they're up to their fourth or fifth Premier Youth Camp getting over a thousand plus on, sorry, about 900 youth from all over Timor, um, all in the one place at the one time. Uh, my partner Emily and I were lucky enough to go to one of these about five years ago and it was very little sleep, huge amount of fun. We all got dragged into doing music and theatre and everything else at nights and then during the day they would learn about permaculture and environmental um, knowledge and food sovereignty um, and also really importantly a lot about respecting and valuing their own culture and, and their own traditional knowledge and I think getting back to what permaculture can offer in development work for me that's one of the strongest parts of it is that permaculture uh, a lot of the knowledge is based on formed around indigenous knowledge so it's got a very natural fit with working with indigenous knowledge and, and culture and being able to strengthen that. And a lot of the feedback in Timor is that that uh, traditional knowledge, which has been weakened over time, actually is more valued and especially within the youth and, and brought um, to the young generations. So that's, maybe not the most expected outcome, but I think it's probably one of the stronger outcomes that you can, you can have. That's such an incredible point to raise. Thanks, Lockie. Um, John or Morag, did either of you want to add anything to that or make any further comments? Um, not off the top of my head, no, Kim. No worries. So we've heard some great examples of really positive projects and what makes permaculture aid projects successful, really strong community focus, community led solutions, working with youth, um, working outdoors in gardens and also including the community and traditional knowledge. What about some of the challenges that you've experienced with permaculture aid projects and also importantly, how the challenges were addressed? I'll throw open to anyone. Yeah, well, I guess um, with our um, small grants project, you're always looking for that, that what they call bang for buck, you know, that, that small amount of money, uh, $2,000. Um, because we're not uh, personally engaged in a lot of these projects, there's an element of trust involved there in terms of, um, you know, um, putting money out there with... Uh, uh, with an understanding that uh, what people write in their application forms is going to um, into happen. So we've been encouraged a lot, particularly um, with assistance uh, from John McKenzie, who's on our team, uh, to make personal contact with a lot of these applications, um, either through email or Skype or Zoom or whatever, just to get a feel for how the, um, how the operation is running. And I, I guess although we do get um, return sort of outcomes in terms of written 
responses to how the money's been spent and how it's gone and some photography and stuff like that. Um, yeah, there's still that there's still that unknown area of well, you know, have we got bang for buck? So that's always been a been a challenge, and I guess it's up to us really to do more evaluation. Um, without being able to physically go to a lot of these places, just the, the evaluation process um, is in, is important. I think to um, to crank up a little bit in terms of um, seeing how that how, how that money has been spent, and whether it's been a worthwhile project. Yeah, sure. Thanks, John. It's such an important point. Um, I know through my experience as well in aid work evaluation is is drummed into to everything and sometimes you seem to spend more time doing the evaluation reporting than actually the implementation and activities as well so it's that fine balance between bang for buck and also um, having the time and, and space for the communities to to run the activities as well which can be really really tricky mm -hmm. um morag or, or Lockie, yeah. anything to jump well, in with sure i mean i always feel like oh, you never quite have enough money mm. to to give to the projects. There's always so much more to do. It always just feels like it's a, a drop in the ocean, or you're just kind of scratching the surface. But but kind of the kind of work that we're we're supporting is is in education, and so and creating commons and spaces that people can see. And so really, it's it's much about trying to ripple it out and support. The, the the local building of the skills and the knowledge and the examples and the resources and the materials so that then it, it has a life of its own. Um, so one of the things, you know, the challenges that I've experienced have been the lack of locally appropriate resources. Like I can give them all the stuff that I have, but you know, it's not in the context that they they use. So I mean what what Lockie's created and they go with the tropical permaculture manual is just absolutely um, brilliant. Uh, and then I'm sort of trying to gather as many different resources as I can along the way. A challenge too is of um, people understanding what what it is. I guess you know, like here in Australia, sometimes when you say refugee, it becomes a like people maybe don't want to hear necessarily because it's a, a challenging thing to take on. And uh, so, really, what we've found is actually just sharing the stories. And what's been the best thing has been the fact that the young people uh, have, have been making friends with one another. They talk to each other every week. And uh, anytime I run a program, there's always people who are from these various settlements who are just part of like, um, the program. Like tonight, for example, uh, one of the guys from the Ramwanjo refugee settlement in Uganda, um, he's doing the presentation on the Permaculture Design Studio Lab, which is part of our program. So people get to see it. And I've just run a permaculture um, business program. And, and I had many people who were part of uh, the refugee settlements on that. And it was interesting because one of the ladies who was from around here said, oh, gosh, you know, I'd only been thinking about doing this business because I wanted to line my pockets to make sure I was okay for my retirement, which is a reasonable thing to do. She said, but now being in this group and having the relationship with with the refugees, I'm actually starting to shift my way of thinking about how it is I'm running my enterprise. So it's like it's this such a a, a, a two way learning experience. And I think that the, the more the relationships are built, the more that we're able to support the various projects as they emerge. And also as stuff happens, like someone, you know, one of the perma youth died recently oh. and and so the community got together, the, the Perma Youth community got together and raised the money to support the family with the funeral expenses and, you know, all these other things. And so, you know, you sort of, you're looking at it, you're going, well, this is not part of the, a permaculture grants program or a garden program, but it's about the people care. How could you not then turn around and support them in that when, if they're not able to address that, they're not able to continue doing the work or the education or anything else. And so it's really, you know, we sort of take, take a step back and, and basically by keeping on telling the story and sharing the examples and, and helping people to get an insight into what life is like, then it's almost like lift, there's not a limited amount. There's this abundance yeah. thinking. So you just tell the story again and more people donate. You tell mm -hmm. another story and more people donate. And because it's 100% going directly to these communities and the feedback goes directly to, to the network, it's, it all kind of works out really nicely like that. But um, 
what I did want to say was that, yeah, just that sense of just not having, not, not having enough, not having enough to, to share with everyone and not having enough time to do the proper reporting and storytelling as well. I would love to have a whole team of volunteers to help, help me, uh, you know, like to share those stories. And I think it's, it's been really helpful lately that um, the capacity of these communities to share their stories on video, on social media, with good photographs has made all the difference because, mm -hmm. you know, I just got this video the other day from a young girl who'd done the permaculture change makers course that was organized there. And we'd funded that. And she got onto this film and she started telling about the, the shift that she'd had in her life and what she was going to do. And she was so, it was such a transformational experience and her video was so authentic that if I, when I, when I share that and I talk about what Josie Ann wants to do now, I'm sure that, I could find someone who could then support her to do that. And so mm -hmm. this thing just, it, yeah, it's, it just keeps going around with the storytelling and sharing people's, what people's lives are like and knowing that, you know, we live in, in this wealthy society that even a small donation makes an enormous difference there. And so what I encourage people to do through this too is to give regularly, you know, like, so some people just tithe monthly amounts mm. and trust that it's going to go to, a, um, to the right spot. Or some people also, um, I've worked out that actually to identify where they want their money spent. So mm. they can go onto the ethos website and they can go, Oh, I'd like to sponsor a new teacher. Oh, I'd like to sponsor mm. a new child. And those categories are there. And so then I know where those people want to spend and that's where I put it. And it's very direct. It's very, um, it's, yeah, so I think that kind of relationship helps to build the trust in in the system. And well, it's what works for us anyway. That's yeah, that's incredible, Maura. Thanks for sharing that, and it's great to hear the the flexibility with with programming there as well. And as you said, people care and putting the the community first. If things change, making sure that you're addressing those needs and supporting the project people you're you're working with as well. What about you, Lockie? Any challenges to share and how you've overcome those as well from your experience? Uh, plenty of challenges out there. <laughs> <laughs> no shortage. <laughs> no shortage. But when, when I, I thought about that question, um, a couple of things came to mind. One, and both of them revolve around habits and changing of habits. So one of the more difficult ones that I've noticed um, is just that in the community level, changing the habit of people burning the land before planting crops. And it's amazing just working through the different land management techniques and some get picked up quickly and some, some not so much. And, but some habits really struggle to kind of get through for various reasons, maybe just because it's easier to just put a match to the land, maybe just because people like fire. Um, and, and uh, but also because often the results of the benefits of not burning take quite a few years to, to come through. Um, but that's one of the issues and I've seen successes just of, and the successes usually come from people within the community who've actually changed their practice and then they're happy to basically be the, the demonstration which people laugh at for a while and then they go oh look that's actually really working and then it slowly takes off and, and grows and it doesn't come from someone from the outside berating and berating and berating um, it comes from people actually like um, local communities actually engaging and, and um, seeing it for themselves um, and on a on a kind of a, a larger level, when you look at international development, the habits of, when, if you look at the um, uh, development world, uh, permaculture is, is very commonly used or agroecology is very commonly used on a project level. Uh, and that's very widely accepted now. Um, but if you take a step up from the project level to the program level, the programs that the national NGOs or international NGOs implement, permaculture and, and related practices are 
are becoming more accepted and are becoming used, but uh, generally the programs aren't based around uh, practices. Sometimes I've seen that, but not very often. But then you take a look to the kind of international um, policy decision-making levels. And that's the area where um, permaculture and, and related practices are finding it hard to, to actually move into that policy level. And there has been a lot of work to, to kind of move that over time, both from within international NGOs and just from showing that permaculture projects work on the ground and that these types of intervention and development need to be taken more seriously. Um, I think the long-term solution is simply research and showing that it works over time. And there is more and more research now and evidence based showing that it works, but it's a slow process filtering permaculture, um, agroecology, food sovereignty, internet into the actual policy levels that we need to see. Mm. Yeah, that's certainly been my experience as well, working with with aid organisations. It's very rare to see the, the P word mentioned, but there's certainly permaculture practices happening on the ground, but in the project proposals or at a, a higher policy or, or funding level. Not so much, though it certainly is is changing. And, you know, some of the places I've worked, some of the donors now are asking for certain environmental criteria which can be really positive that people have to put it in their projects now to be to be funded but perhaps the change is not moving moving fast enough but John or Morag did you have anything to add to that from your experiences as well thanks Lockie or any experience with the sustainable development goals or wider policy implementation of permaculture in aid organizations yeah, I've just um, recently been working with uh, an organisation called Realliance, which is a collection of people. I'm, uh, maybe, maybe, I'm, are you guys also part of that? That it's, it's a it's an international alliance of people who work in permaculture in in um, sort of humanitarian work, basically, and it has um, connections with with Lush as well, and the. Um, Anyway, we were just recently, actually just last week, finished doing a whole series of, of programs with an organisation um, called Malteser International and they're working with uh, exploring um, permaculture solutions for, um, for settlement design, for the food systems, for um, the new, new settlements for Syrian refugees. And so you know, at really high level. So there's people from, from all the policy levels, but also from on the ground. And so it was really interesting to have that spread of, of, um, of people there involved. So this was sort of the initial web webinar series for educating the people who were kind of at that policy level. And then there's going to be a practical on the ground. So, so that, you know, and permaculture was right there, smack bang um, front and center and being spoken about um, all the time. And so that was really exciting to see that. Um, and also just at various different um, organisations and uh, I don't know, all different sorts of levels from government and non-government, hearing permaculture being talked about a lot more. I think, you know, I think it's permaculture's time has come in terms of not shying away from using the P word and actually just speaking up. And I think this is the whole kind of uh, idea of, of the, the permaculture ambassadors as well was that you know what it is that we talk about just such good common sense and such good practice and as we know that it works on the ground and there's so much evidence as Lockie says it's really just you know documenting but documenting it by 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 calling it permaculture as well and that's where we'll start to see that so you know I'd love to see a whole lot more you know um you know sort of research or um people at you know various sorts of universities actually focusing in on that and and uh and also us all speaking out a lot more like mm -hmm. writing in various papers getting on the radio talking up speaking up advising into different um you know new directions that are happening right now because th that's happening at every single level everything's being rethought 
to to step up and speak up and get into those things and um, and uh, insert uh, the permaculture approach into those. No, that's great to hear. It's so so happy to hear about Malteser International and all of the other um, activities you just mentioned as well, Morag. That's fantastic. We're nearing the end of our our time, so what I'd like to hear from each of you just before we wrap up about your plans with your respective activities, charities, workplaces for 2021 and beyond. So perhaps, John, did you want to jump in first, then Lockie, then Morag? Plans? Well, on a personal level, COVID's got a lot to, um, <laughs> got to answer for in terms of where we may end up going or not. Um, I guess Permafund will continue. I mean, we've, we've been... Um, the amount of money we're getting in from donors is, is increasing. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that continues to do so. So I guess by the end of, um, of, of, of next year, um, it'd be, um, you know, hopeful, hopeful we can put out another, an, another grant round. Um, I've, I've really been enjoying uh, what Ro Morrow and her group have been doing in terms of uh, the refugee programs. Um, and it's it's really good to see that um, that slowly sort of um, coming coming on. And you know, with the work morag has been doing in Kenya, um, I think the issue of refugees is going to be uh, very commonplace in the in the years and decades to come. And moving into that space is is it's been really heartening to see that to see that happen. You know, it's been it's interesting. I, I sort of um, I came into permaculture, I guess, watching the Global Gardener series that Bill did and I always thought it was an aid project when I saw it and you know I, I think um, above all Bill Mollison was very much a humanitarian in terms of um, helping helping the most you know the most needy out and it'd be good to see more of a focus um, from our part of the world move toward um, helping people out that, 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 that really need it. Awesome. Thanks, John. What about you, Lockie, and with Permatil Global? Yeah, we've um, had a big year this year. So moving the uh, creating a new organisation that's Australian based to support the work in Timor, uh, but also to uh, further develop the, the work that we'd like to do internationally and to partner with other organisations. Um, so that's one of the three volumes of the permaculture, Tropical Permaculture Guidebook that um, we, we offer it on a pay what you can basis because most people who need to access the book can't afford to pay for it. Um, and we do that because that's part of our being in permaculture. You need to um, create fair share economy that can support people and support the environment and the planet. Um, so we also obviously need to function and we're kind of moving towards um, having a system where we've got friends of Permatil Global where people make regular contributions or make contributions in return for either the printed book or the um, or the digital version, being able to download it. And that helps us to keep going. So our, our first focus is to translate the guidebook from English. We've almost finished the Timorese Tetan version. We've had great news that the Spanish version is moving um, with some translators that we're working with. Um, but yeah, hopefully that will take a lot more steps next year but Spanish, French and Portuguese and Indonesian are the next languages. Uh, obviously getting what we're doing into the languages of the people who need it um, is really important. Um, so we'd like to keep on expanding that but also to work to develop other resources and to help skill up people to develop their own resources. That's ultimately the goal is so that people can develop their own resources that are practical and useful in their own communities. So we're really looking forward to, um, yeah, to kind of building on all the structural work that we've been doing this year, as boring as it is, it's extremely important to, to be able to set that up 
and to next year actually start really getting into the practical uh, work. And um, as John said, maybe, I don't think I'll be heading back to Timor or Indonesia next year, but hopefully the year after, we'll just hopefully things keep going better. But, uh, but it's great to be able to work um, still very closely together with the team in Timor and to, to be working with other groups around the world as well. Yeah, amazing. All right. Yeah, that's, you know, like, like John, um, we were planning to be lots of different places this year and also next year, but uh, we're, we're home based and actually it's given us a new way of, of working together and, and the changed way I think is, is actually really interesting. And so uh, next year, uh, our focus is uh, really looking at how to create a whole lot of um, uh, information uh, on getting uh, local community seed banks happening and getting local seed saving training and uh, an exchange of local seeds happening to all these different refugee groups from other groups that are happening, uh, supporting the emergence of PEMI youth hubs in lots more different places. So actually supporting uh, the teachers one spot to go to another place and then the people from there to go to others. So we're just really looking at trying to help support them to do that. Um, more, more work with, with women's groups in, in various different places to, um, to look at uh, women's health. I mean, one of the big issues that's happened um, because of the teenage pregnancies is a lot of young girls who now um, are really struggling and have, have babies now too. So um, nutrition gardens for young women and health and childcare, education and, and local enterprise um, clubs with young women. So that would be a, a, quite a big focus that's attached to the PEMI youth movement. Um, so, so that's part of it too. We've also um, aligned with um, the university um, in Malaysia um, that uh, has an SDG secretariat there. So we're doing some work um, with them. Also, they work with refugees in that area and the Maltesers and Realize, I don't know, lots of work, lots of lots of different projects, but particularly our focus is always on, on youth and, and women and really just trying to create um, environments where they have the skills and the knowledge and the access to the resources they need to be able to meet their basic needs and to ripple it out and to keep addressing what it is that they need to be addressing. That's amazing. Far out. It's going to be a busy 2021 for, for all of you. And it sounds like there's some great activities happening there that are certainly worthy of support. Um, I'll put the links for the Ethos Foundation, the Permaculture Education Institute and Perma Youth, Permatil Global and the Tropical Permaculture Guidebook and Permafund as well as Brogo Permaculture Gardens all at the bottom of this video so you can check out and have a look at the great work that John Morag and Lockie are up to as well as their colleagues um, around the world. A huge thank you to the three of you for joining the call today. Despite our IT challenges, we made it to the end okay. Um, have a wonderful holiday break, however you choose to celebrate, and look forward to seeing all of the great activities you continue to do around the world in 2021. Thanks for all of your fabulous work. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Thanks Morag. You're lucky. Lucky. Yeah, and you guys as well.